Good afternoon, data community, and welcome back to downtown Los Angeles, California. We're here at Terra Data Possible. My name is Savannah Peterson. I'm really enjoying my day next to Rob Streche. Rob, I, have have we had as many fun guests on before in a show as we've had today? I don't know. It'd be tough to tough. It's a tough comparison. That's for sure. They're making it tough to compare to today. This you're, has you're been a lot of fun. You're such a diplomat. I know, I know. This has this has been a total <laughs> lot of fun. And speaking of fun, we have two really fun guests sitting here on the desk with us. Brene and Vidat, thank you so much for taking time today. Thanks thank for you. having us. This yeah. has got to be a wild week for both of you, getting to see your customers, your community, your teams. Vidat, what does it mean for you to be here this week? Uh, it is a great experience to uh, get to know multiple people, not only from our client side, but also our partners, as well as, well as analysts and, um, and other, other uh, prospects. So um, multiple industries, you get to know different people from different industries and background. That's, that's been amazing. Yeah, and, and a big piece of what we've been talking about in getting to know that is that people are always in inquisitive about how they get value out of their data and how they're creating value with their data. A lot are leaning on AI as, oh, this is the holy grail for doing that. AI's been around for more than a minute now. Uh, so how do you see it with the customers and how have the customers really been leaning into creating value with their data? Yeah, when you said you know, they, AI has been around for a long time, of course, I am an AI practitioner myself, uh, so I did my PhD and worked in multiple industries and companies and trying to get AI and machine learning to value. Uh, so I know the challenges, what I went through. I have successes, I also have failures, and I can relate to it really well. And uh, that's why, you know, business value is the most important thing for AI. Uh, unless you can show that the, the the cost savings or revenue increases more than the investment, then there's no point. Uh, that's why you know, we uh, purposefully uh, defined our trusted AI as the way that people, data and AI work together with transparency to create value. And when I explain this, I usually start at the end because the value is the ultimate goal that you need to achieve, that you need to have cost-effective, innovative, and performant AI in production. And the way that to achieve that goes through transparency and people. So business value, the most important thing uh, for AI. Absolutely, and, and the ability to, I mean, like you said, you know, we, we talk about making AI real. It's not real until it's out in the wild and you know, my mom's interacting with it and getting some benefit and value add from it, not just in these POC use cases like we've been talking about. Speaking of, speaking of value, uh, CX is a big space here for AI. One of the earlier verticals of adoption within organizations or uh, groups within organizations. We haven't had a chance to talk about it, but you have a custom complaint analyzer, yeah. correct? Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, thanks for having me on your channel. Our pleasure. Right. And I think uh, the AI is impacting quite a lot in this customer experience kind of scenario. And we have uh, been developing a customer complaint analyzer, and we have also found a lot of insights into it. So the top, for any customer, the top things, what he has on his mind is to resolve his problems, mm -hmm. right? You as a customer, you may be interacting with your banks, with your retailers, but for you, the most important is, okay, is my problem getting solved or not? Right. And many of the customers would even walk away from a brand just after one bad experience, right? And to give you some statistic behind this, if you take the US financial industry, most of the banks, they receive about a million complaints just in a span of like two or three months. And this data is coming from CFPB, which is this Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And you can imagine the volume, but also the types of complaints. You can have complaints which is coming from text format. You can have complaints which is coming in a voice format. People complain about simple things like, okay, my credit card is not working. On, on, on the other hand, they can also complain about like, guys, you are doing some kind of insider trading, right? So it can, a vast, right. it, you can have a vast variety of complaints. So it's very important to understand what are these complaints, what are these topics, and how to kind of uh, quickly react back 
and give a resolution back to the customer because this is where you are adding value and you are reducing churn. So our customer complaint analyzer does that exactly. It tries to analyze with the power of AI and generative AI different type of complaints and making sure that at the end the customer is happy and we have a perfect visualization for that particular customer. I can really see that helping out in volume. I mean, a million complaints in a quarter is what yeah. you just said there, which yeah. is pretty nuts. Yeah. How long does it take you to tune a model like this or to come up with that solution? I'll keep it with you, Pranay, just for a yeah. second. So what we are currently doing is, um, most of the time it goes in the data preparation. Like, mm -hmm. Because we have to combine voice data, we have to combine text data. And I think uh, from a timing point of view, it depends on different uh, projects, but I can say it could take about 80% of the time goes in the data preparation. And even just with that voice and text, you've got people yeah. with different accents, lexicons, speaking yeah. different languages. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Z axis of complexity yeah. starts to get pretty it, wild it, there. And also to give you like, we're also doing a project in uh, Saudi Arabia, and the text is reverse. Right, right, <laughs> and the language is not English, right? So you can imagine uh, the complexity of all the data preparation and also kind of integrating different data sets. You can have the same customer who has launched a complaint in text format, but at the same time, if it doesn't get resolved, he will call, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm from France, I know that people like calling quite a lot, right? So <laughs> you can have a lot of complaints, same person calling again and again. And so it's important to process the data of, uh, like in a nice way, it's also important to relate back that who is the customer behind mm -hmm. this complaint. Identify what is the topic of the complaint, and then we can start applying the generative AI and all that kind of stuff on how to best respond to this complaint. Right? So the data preparation takes quite a amount of time. When it comes to AI, largely, fortunately, we have um, our cloud partners who have excellent large language models who will go through all the different texts, all the different formats, and will uh, tell you, okay, this is the topic, this is, uh, they also summarize the complaint for us. The complaints could be 1,000 words long, right? And, <laughs> they, Ooh, can, yeah. and, and they, can, they can summarize it into like nice text, like two, three line text, so that uh, the bank people can understand what it is. And then, of course, the biggest thing, I think, is as Vedat was telling, how, what is the value? So you have mm -hmm. to somehow operationalize it Right? It's good to know what is the people are complaining about, but then you have to come out with a resolution because you can apply all the models, but if you don't resolve the complaint, you don't add value. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and exactly. then people are even more mad that you spent you exactly. wasted time messing around with exactly. AI instead of exactly. solving my stuff. Exactly. Right, and how, how does that really tie Gen AI into this? Because I, I think for me, I, I can imagine how it would be, uh, having filled out and had over a thousand word complaint to a particular airline that I won't talk about, but <laughs> they actually, but they resolved it, they solved it, um, it, but it didn't fit in their, in the space on their website, so I attached a Word doc with the full oh, text. Yeah. To your point, I created more. You were determined more, to set that complaint. I was very dis determined, and I usually don't do that, but they pushed me and it is what it is. But, so, I'm, I'm, I'm going to generally assume that it went into some, Gen AI to do summarization and pick out. How do you see, as, you know, in this way or in, in other ways, Gen AI playing a role in there? Well, this is, as Pranay mentioned, those complaints come in different shapes and forms, right? You know, if you go to predictive AI only, you need structured data. Mm. So you would spend time to convert or find a way to convert a script of an audio to structured data. But you know, Gen AI is a perfect tool and technology to bring all those different complaints together and then analyze it and give you a perspective for resolution. So, it is also a great example where you can actually combine predictive AI with Gen AI. As Pranay said, after you analyze the, the complaints, you need to find resolution. At times, you may be able to use predictive model to say, for this uh, customer's complaint, this person or this department would be the best to resolve that so that you are able to reduce churn or increase retention uh, or increase conversion. So uh, it's, it's a fantastic example for Gen AI uh, to create business value through uh, resolutions of you know, those complaints coming from multiple data sources. 
Do you, <laughs> oh, just just because yeah, yeah. you hit on something that was really interesting to me. Do you see Gen AI as being able to help build the data that then can be used either in predictive or causal mm -hmm. models question. afterwards? Is yeah, that actually, thanks a lot for reminding me. I was going to say that and yeah. I forgot in the line yeah. of thought. Well, you know, as you resolve those complaints and as you analyze them and you classify them, that will become a learning for that Gen AI model for the future complaints and therefore, you are able to build the know-how to faster and better analyze them yeah. and faster and better resolve them uh, because yeah. of that learning. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it creates a great opportunity from that perspective. Yeah. That's also, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I think this is a very uh, critical point and it also shows the future of Gen AI. So currently, in our projects, most of the people who are resolving are humans, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but Imagine a future where for certain type of complaints you have AI resolving it, right? Yeah. But that future would happen if it, it learns from the current resolutions. So this is where the data which is generated and how actually do you resolve, right? It would be in the future, it will be uh, augmenting what we call it as agents, like resolution agents, right. which would resolve like certain type of complaints uh, so that it is much faster and much efficient way to kind of get uh, the resolution and the customer is happy. You got the resolution faster, as well as there's a lot of saving also for also for the enterprise. Yeah, I mean we yes. talk about them being small action models and yeah. you know yeah. groups and chaining of agents and things of that. Yeah, nature. I wanted to connect it to sustainability because yeah. Let's as, talk about you know it. I am very passionate about it because you know we saw that everyone talks about the value, value, value of Gen AI, but people sometimes don't talk about the cost or sustainability. You know, if you build a 350,000 GPU data center, it's not going to run on air. You know, it needs power and water. So uh, if you are able to uh, resolve problems such as customer complaints by using very well trained small language models, that means you are not using as much energy. And those are really important for sustainability perspectives as well. What are some of the other ways that customers can make their AI journey sustainable? You mentioned using smaller compute so that you're using less energy, but there's got to be other ways that AI makes these companies more sustainable in the conversations that you're having. Yeah, I think uh, some of our speakers today on the main stage talked about it. As you said, you know, depending on the specific business problem, using sometimes small language model on CPU, not even on GPU, will right. give you the value. And if you are very smart in terms of finding the, the most impactful use cases that require optimal or optimized level of resources to create value, that's how you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also another thing our presenters mentioned, and I liked it a lot, you know, sometimes people may be like, hey, let's do the best thing, right? You know, let's train and fine tune this large language model. Do you really need that? So you need to have trusted advisors, and Teradata is a trusted advisor, with your teams to get together, brainstorm the impactful use cases, and then score them and find the leading ones in terms of complexity and value, and you tackle them one by one. That's how you achieve sustainability across industries. Um, yeah, and I, I think one of the things about being sustainable is not moving things around all the time. And how do, how, how do you really achieve, because like you said, the, yeah. the data is multimodal, right? It's, it's not just text, it's not just video or voice or what have you. How do you see that, how does Teradata really bring that together? Yeah, so I think uh, what I can answer, it will also answer your sustainability question together. Yeah. So today, just today we released uh, this new capability about bring your own large language model. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, sending the data outside uh, to make some prediction to do generative, why not just bring the model inside your platform? Right, so we uh, provide this capability to do so. This also uh, helps in the sustainability course because you are not moving the data around, but also it helps in different cases, for example, real time. If you want to achieve real time resolution of complaints, if you have the model within your platform, it is much, much more efficient. In addition, 
it's also about uh, integrating your model with the rest of the data. So even though if I come, if I analyze a complaint in a very detailed way and I try to find what is the topic inside it, if I do not integrate it with the rest of the data, with the customer 360 degree data, it just re remains a kind of insightful information, but it is not which is operationalized, right? So right. this is the usefulness of bringing the model inside the platform so that the model is like data. It gets integrated with the rest of the data, leading to much, much more efficient operationalization as well as sustainability. Yeah, if I may add something to Please? that, you know, uh, <laughs> My experience in financial industry before Teradata, I was running a data science team working on multiple predictive models at the same time. And I realized that each of my team member is hitting the database and through, through those complex queries, they're pulling the data and most of those features are the same. Right. It, but they are using it for different models. I'm like, there is something wrong here, so we have enterprise feature store. You know, including yeah. customer complaint analyzer for any other model, if you're able to pull your features and build your analytics data set once, you can then just append it with the new records or new data, uh, rather than every time you run the model, you go to the all those whole data systems yeah. and pull them again. And imagine that, you know, we practitioners, it never works in the first time, okay? You run a model, you realize that you forgot something. You run it again. And then you want to try a different algorithm, you also run that. And then you make a presentation to stakeholders and they tell you, well, we need to change the time window. Here are new business rules. Here are some guardrails. So you have to go back and rerun, rerun everything. Imagine that how many times you are going to be hitting the data, right? So if you have a feature store that is already there, you don't need to consume a lot of resources or bandwidth, yeah. you will reuse it. So that's, that's really important for, um, for our customers and Teradata provides that. Absolutely, and making sure that you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Yes. You've just got a great tire store there just waiting for you, whatever yeah. car you want to drive, you're just ready to yeah. rock, whether yeah. that be your, your, your yes. adventure mobile or your Lamborghini, <laughs> you're, you're all set up, or your F1 car, yeah. we were talking about F1 earlier. I have one last question for both of you, and I'm very curious what you have to say. Now I'm going to start with you first, since you're the lucky one immediately okay. on my left. You are obviously deep in this, very exciting. I can sense the energy from both of you and your mm -hmm. passion about what you're working on. What do you hope to be able to say a year from now at the next Teradata Possible that you can't say yet today? All right, so I would like to say that um, we help our customers to help their customers to resolve their complaints in an efficient way, leading value to both the end customer as well as the enterprise. And I would like to, in the next possible, give a tangible value to that. Yes, this so is actually being uh, able to measure that exactly. too. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, and I think um, I would also like to state that, so this, this year we, we are talking about different capabilities, but I would like to see the world evolve towards solving real problems. Yes. I, 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 this is what I uh, wish for the next possible. All right, we're with you on that one. What about you, Vidat? <laughs> well, as, as he mentioned, you know, we announced bring your own large language model, right? So I know Gen AI will become easier for our clients to be able to find the impactful use cases and bring them to value. Yeah. So I would like to see those next year, you know, large language model or gen AI use cases and presentations in the breakout sessions. But yes. in, in relation to that, as Martin Wilcox presented today, uh, we have not still achieved the, the potential value of predictive and prescriptive AI yet. Right there are still a lot of work to do and, and the value to be gained. What I am hoping that the, uh, the emphasis and benefits of Gen AI as it materializes, it will also enable those failure percentages that you have heard today, right? Yeah. 80%, 65%, or maybe even yeah. 85, to go down for predictive and prescriptive AI as well. And we mm -hmm. have you know, recognition of 
true bottom line value from clients in terms of all those use cases. I love that. Well, I cannot wait to tell those stories with you back on this stage next year. But that, Pranay, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks. Thank you very thank much you. for having yeah, us. This has been a blast as yes. always, Rob. And thank all of you for tuning in. We are midway through our full day of coverage here at Terra Data Possible in Los Angeles, California. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news. <laughs>